Hi, everybody. What a pleasure to welcome Christy Montu to uh, today's Happy Hour, the Living History series, this talk. Christy, please, please tell us about Living Histories. Thank you, Shri. I just want to thank Shri and Orit for this really generous invitation to be part of this community and space and to share a bit of my personal history with you on how I went from curious kid to curious academic. This is me at probably five years old in the mountains of Southern California, where I grew up exploring mountain forests, orange groves and Christmas tree farms in the foothills where my grandparents had a farm and the coastal chaparral and tide pools of the Pacific. This is my father, Gary Montooth. He's an audiologist and has a deep fascination with all things science. And this is our family friend, Chet Shera. And he and his wife, Kathy Shera, were like a second family. They had a home in the local mountains, and so we could frequently visit this space. It was, in fact, Chet, who's an excellent photographer, who took this picture of me 33 years later. And I chose this image not because it makes me look way more glamorous than I actually am, um, but because it captures me at a very important uh, transition for me as an academic. I'm just a few days out here from finally signing a contract so that my partner Colin and I could be tenure track faculty at the same institution after six hard years as an assistant professor by myself. And while I did not know it at the time, I was newly pregnant with my first child. My earliest memories are of exploration. We camped and I spent so many hours at the beach and hiking and collecting shells and insects. And when I wasn't outside, I was surrounded by books. These spaces, nature and the garden and novels, they really remain my refuge. They're my place where I can center myself uh, and re-energize when the world is just too much. And they kindle my curiosity and remind me of the connections and the complexities that hold the world and our communities together. When Shri and Orit invited me to give a talk in this series, my first response was, but I'm not a biological physicist, but maybe my research touches this space. And so I started thinking of my trajectory in the context of how did a curious kid from the mountains of Southern California end up, uh, and who did not come from a particularly academic family, end up at UC Santa Barbara to participate in the KITP program on cellular energetics. So this is a place where theoretical physicists spend a lot of time. And why would an integrative evolutionary biologist be invited to this theoretical physics institute? And why would she say yes? And that latter part is easy. I really thrive on interdisciplinary connections and I love the beach at Santa Barbara. It's where my uncles live, and it's where I first saw monarch butterflies overwintering, which is now a subject of research in our lab. So my trajectory is, I would say, a path by which curiosity and maybe a natural pattern I have of seeing connections between things really meant that biological complexity was a natural playground for me as a scientist and led me to develop my research to develop as a researcher who values interdisciplinary spaces and could bring expertise in evolutionary genetics to this community of biological physicists who are focused on questions of cellular energetics. So at the end of this trajectory, there's this is me just a few months ago, and I think it sums me up pretty well right now. This is me with my girls, Imogen and Cora, and we're out at our school's Cedar Point Biological Station where my partner Colin and I were collecting field crickets for a new collaborative research project, while I simultaneously led a writing retreat for graduate students. Over the years, I have finally come to think of myself as a writer. For now, a writer of science, but who knows, maybe someday I'll write a novel. So where's the beginning of the tra trajectory? These are my parents, Gary and Sandy Montooth, and they 100% encouraged my curiosity. They valued education, both of them are educators, and they provided throughout my life a foundation for my independence and my independent thinking. I have two amazing brothers, Colby and Kyle, and my parents encouraged our exploration of the physical and natural world 
through what they called serendipities that we took on weekends and holidays, which I now appreciate despite the label of serendipity required a committed and concerted effort by our parents. This encouragement was then nurtured by really phenomenal high school teachers that I had. This is Doc House and he in fact has a handlebar mustache and he taught me biology through the lens of a naturalist. We learned about biodiversity and evolution. We watched David Attenborough on film reels every Friday and we went out in nature to collect and observe. I was encouraged as a critical reader and writer um, by a literature teacher, Martha Topic. And she introduced me to writers like Margaret Atwood and Stephen Jay Gould. And these teachers never asked me to choose between science and the humanities. They encouraged my exploration of both. And in fact, this is the book that Martha Topic gave me when I graduated. And I've kept it with me in my office ever since because it has this really amazing inscription that reads, Unlike the sterile Gilead, our society cushions faith with love and hope. My hope is that you go out into the world as Papageno and Stephen Jay Gould do to capture in words the most beautiful objects in nature and to sense how rich and complex it is out there so it can continue to exist and to inspire us all to productivity, which is an amazing thing to write to a young person who's setting out on their academic trajectory. I think this is probably a good time to pause and point out that my path has not been all encouraging words. Like too many of us, I've heard discouraging words. I have experienced the senior female bully. I have been sexually harassed. I have been told by male peers that women could not excel as both scientists and mother. But somehow these are not the words that have stayed with me and they're certainly not the words that have found a home on my office bookshelf. I think I chose early on to trust in the words of the people who believed in me. And I'm forever grateful to have had this privilege of having people in my life show me that they believed in me. Too many young people are never told this and that's something that we need to work actively to change. But back to the question of how did I get invited to this theoretical physics institute? And as best as I can guess, the invitation was because of my research that attempts to understand the complexity of gene-gene and gene-environment interactions through the lens of cellular energetics. And my first seminar that I gave post my second maternity leave, so I left these two little ones and flew to Boston to give what's called the theory lunch at Harvard Med Systems Biology. And it's there that I met Mark Kirshner, who's a prior speaker in this series, and I imagine this must be the route through which Dan Needleman, who co-organized the program, learned of my research interests and thought about what I could contribute to this, this research group. So what shapes the trajectory of a curious kid who likes to make connections to develop research interests in biological complexity? Well, from a very young age, I wanted to be an evolutionary biologist and get my PhD, and I have no idea why. I, I didn't know anyone, I only knew of someone who had their PhD and it was the father-in-law, so the father of Kathy Shara was a naturalist who worked for the Forest Service. And even that may be a bit of a legend story in my mind, but nevertheless, I wanted my PhD in evolutionary biology and I thought I would be a forest ranger. But then of course, like so many of us, I got to the university and I was really fortunate to experience the real power that mentoring can have in the university setting. At University of California, Irvine, which was just down the street from where I grew up, I took all kinds of classes. I took comparative literature courses with Professor Julia Lepton, and I took physics with Professor Greg Benford, who's an astrophysicist, but also a science fiction writer. And they served as great role models for me. And I was incredibly blessed to do four years of research with Doc Gibbs here, and he's been a true mentor. Uh, he was somebody who always believed in me, even when I, quote, wrote like an English major, which I now take as a compliment. He taught me about evolution and physiology and biochemical adaptation, and he really launched me in my career. In fact, he took me to the evolution meetings, a big international meeting in 1997, 
And I remember calling my mom from the dorm and telling her that I was going to be a professor of evolutionary biology. These role models showed me that you can just be a person who's driven by curiosity to understand complex connections in our world. So my academic path really has its foundations in, in the ideas in this book of biochemical adaptation. And I went to graduate school with this really grand ambition to link evolutionary physiology to genes. Um, and I did this in the age, at the beginning age of genomics. So I went to Penn State and then later the lab moved to Cornell to work with mentors, Jim Martin, who's an insect physiologist, and Andy Clark down here, who's a population geneticist. And this was just about the time when shotgun sequencing was enabling genomics. So in 1998, when I was a first year graduate student, was when we were starting to use shotgun genomic sequencing to sequence the Drosophila uh, fruit fly genome. And the field of ecological genomics was on the horizon. So it was really an exciting time. And I was surrounded by a wonderful cohort of young scientists who were using genetic and genomic approaches to link genes and phenotypes in the context of evolution. I then took these tools to do my postdoc with a wonderful mentor and scientist, David Rand. And it's there that I really established my relationship and love of the mitochondria, both because of its central role in eukaryotic energetics, but also because of its unique coevolutionary dynamic with the nuclear genome. And along this path somewhere, I came to own the idea of myself as an integrative biologist. I have also benefited by charting a dual academic path with Colin Micklejohn, with whom I've done some of my best genetics. We spent four years apart while I established a lab at Indiana University as assistant professor. And it was six years before we were both able to establish labs at the same institution here at, at UNL in Nebraska. Moving a lab is never easy, but what I didn't anticipate was what a profound transition this would be for me and what a positive transition it was. I went from a department that saw my potential and was a really great place to work, but I came to a department in a university here that really supports me to achieve my vision. And that is to be an integrated biologist who creates spaces where disciplines intersect that empower the discovery of how genes, physiology, and evolution shape a diverse world. So now I think I am squarely in what one would call the like mid-career stage. Um, and I think probably a good time to reflect on what inspires me and my job. My research has become only more collaborative and interdisciplinary as I try to make connections from molecules up to population scale dynamics and do this in a range of organisms from paramecium to drosophila to monarch butterflies. I'm a passionate advocate and facilitator now of so many other people's research ideas. So these are just a lot of people that I've worked with. Um, and these are seven of the 12 undergraduates that I collaborate and do research with in my lab right now. And I continue to find meaning and make impact by trusting in the words of those who believe in me, but now also by being that person who believes in others. And that's the end of my 10 minute story about my trajectory. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Christy. Wow, thank you. Um, audience, would you like to jump in and ask a question or two? Please just unmute yourself and go for it. Do I see half a hand raised? Okay. If not, I'll ask the question first and maybe break the ice. Um, so Christy, um, again, wow, I'm still processing. Thank you. Um, let me follow up on a, on, a, on a vision for mentorship that you brought up and ask you, maybe it's an opportune time to ask um, about um, female role models. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about like moving past the super basic model of lean and, <laughs> you know, hard elbows, um, 
Yeah, yeah. You'll notice that all that my like my mentors in science were all white men, mm. and most of the female role models I had were actually in the humanities. Um, so I did not benefit from having. In fact, I I didn't have a female biology professor until I was a senior in college. So, but I would say that the my the male mentors that I did have were in, they were incredible role models, and they they facilitated. Uh, I mean, there was I did not have any barriers from them. They they were tremendous role models, and they trained a lot of um, outstanding female scientists. So, um, yeah, I didn't. I didn't have a lot of people to role model being a, a role model or being a mentor, a female mentor in, in science. Um, following so I'm up, trying to do the best, the best I can. So, so following up on that then, um, to your female mentees, what kind of vision of role model, role model shift do you transmit then? Yeah, I think this, um, to recognize re the recognition of barriers, you know, nobody was talking about barriers and, and what they were, that they existed, that there would be a lot of BS around you uh, that, that would be there like weighing you down. It just nobody talked about it. And so I, I think what I try to do a lot now is just be very um, honest about, about that. Say like, look, there's going to be like, let's just to myself, like, let's see where there's barriers and let's just do what we can to get rid of those. Like things that may seem insignificant to us can be huge for a, a person early in their career, right? So just the words, I mean, the, the fact that that, that Miss Topic wrote those words in that book, I, I just can't even believe that, right? It, it's an amazing thing that she wrote. And I don't know if it how it influenced me then. It certainly influences me when I go back and read it now. That that one thing just meant so much. Just knowing when somebody tells you that they believe in you, that that you're gonna do great things. I think we my I would say my mentors didn't actually say those things to me, but they showed me, right? They showed me through behavior. But I think now we can be more like I can tell you, like if you, I believe in you, I believe that you can do this. Why would you be? Why would you be here if you if you couldn't do this? And and just that to know that like a few little words that we might share or a letter of recommendation that we might put out there, it can be huge. Um. So I think the recognition of barriers, as the mentor recognizing the barriers, um, and and just seeing where you can do little things to to get over the help people over those. I see there's another raised hand. Um. Arpita, go for it. Hi. Hi, Christy. Wonderful Hi. to hear your, your story. Thank you. Uh, a question I have maybe kind of for younger people. I see a lot of younger scientists, you know, PhD students or postdocs who are very bright, very talented, but they shirk away from going into academia and, you know, pursuing what might be their passion. But, you know, the, the thought of the uncertainty uh, you know, maybe creates this barrier for them. You know, they're not able to make that decision. And so I'm always kind of thinking about what to tell them. And I do talk to them about my own, own stories, but I wanted to ask you what, how did you deal with that? How did you make that decision of, you said from an early age, you wanted to do a PhD, which is also fantastic. Like, you know, PhD in evolutionary biology, but then, you know, to actually continue that and then pursue uh, your uh, passion into academia. How, how did you make those decisions? I'm not going to say that I was particularly intentional or deliberate. I think I like, I really, I'm really curious. I didn't want to leave school. Um, I really love the, I love the questions I was working on. I think because I saw this connection between I saw what was on the horizon and that and that's because I was in a department I think that um, was very forward looking at the time. So I was excited about that that next step. Um, and then 
I would say I wasn't faced with the the challenge that a lot of people faced right after I got jobs. So I got jobs right before two, I got my job right before 2008. And so it's after, it was after that, that a lot of my colleagues and my cohorts, there were just years and years and years where there, there weren't jobs. And so I, I think the, I'm just fortunate to have gotten into my job when there were a lot of jobs and not very many people to fill those positions. And I recognize now seeing my own trainees, um, I mean, there was no Twitter, right? I wasn't like constantly seeing other people's successes and not all of the rejection letters that they get. So I think that I, I didn't see I didn't see the chat. I knew the challenges of grant writing. I mean, I, I had I had good mentors. I they I saw them trying to get grants, hustling the money. Um, I knew all of those aspects, but I I wasn't I didn't have that challenge of like the having to apply for, you know, I mean, hundreds of positions and and not not getting a job. That's a, a daunting thing. And um but on the other hand, there's a lot, but I think there's so many more job opportunities out there that, that are to do research at institutes that are not academic. So I now have a trainee who just got a job running a lab at Ancestry.com. I have a trainee working in sustainable agriculture. I have a trainee doing SciComm at a museum at Ohio State. So on the flip side of that, there's actually, it may be that those jobs, either they didn't exist or there weren't very many of them, or our professors didn't show them those jobs to us. So while the, I think that combination of um, recognizing that it, it is a hard, right now still a hard job market, but that there's also all these other jobs that, that people may love. And so I think you know, we, we shouldn't hold on to the idea that the, that the faculty position at a tenure track institution is gonna be the best fit for everybody too. So letting go a little bit of that, um, in my mind, that is like, ever since I got to grad school, that was what people were saying you would do. So I, I think some of it is letting go of that and realizing it, it may actually not be the best career choice for everybody. And that's, that's great. I mean, we need, we need smart scientists doing all kinds of work in, in our communities. I mean, one problem is that we all, like we're all sitting here in our offices and um, it, you know, we're not interfacing with the public enough and look, look where we are. Uh, well, Christy, thank you. Thank you so much again for that super inspiring talk and for leaving us with that very thought provoking question. Um, on behalf of everybody, many, many- Thank thanks. you.